today I'm in Walton on Thames talking to Jeremy Chapman, who is, everybody would say, a legendary golf tipster. Jeremy, thank you very much for agreeing to do this. Can you give us some of your background, please? Well, I come from a totally non betting, non racing family. I was born in Wallasey, Cheshire in 1941. And, uh, well, they were anti betting. I mean, it was very sordid in those days. They thought betting shops weren't in then. We, Betting was a difficult proposition and not very savoury. Uh, and um, I never had an interest in, in racing and betting till I got a job as a cub reporter in, in, in uh, Amersham. And then the, the new sports editor was uh, took me to Ascot. Very exciting, but unfortunately the whole meeting was wet, rained off. <laughs> Uh, but I uh, went to Ascot and winter a bit, but uh, and then I got a job in in uh, Ealing, in the Middlesex County Times as a sports editor there, and we had a very betting shop very close. Of course, that was long after we had the betting shop starting in 1961, but that was a big uh, pull as well, wasn't it, when there was betting shops about. But, uh, after uh, I wrote off to Fleet Street uh, on a whim because I wasn't getting on with the editor of the Middlesex County Times, I wrote a very flippant letter to see because I didn't think I'd have a chance because I've no. Normally, uh, Fleet Street people come from the provinces on daily papers, and uh, I had only five years' experience on the weekly paper. So, anyway, the sports editor, the great Bob Finlay. Uh, took a shine to the letter, he thought it was quite funny, and then he gave me a job, probably because I was very cheap. Started on £32 a week. And, uh, cause he, he was a betting fanatic, a greyhound punter, and he had, <laughs> every night he would back the last favourite at uh, Wimbledon Unseen. And uh, he kept ringing up the office, but because he was with, with a wife who didn't know about his compulsive gambling, you had to sort of pretend uh, something else, he looked, seeing that I was checking it up something and then he just slip it in and anyway <laughs> we were uh, we had a good time for six years on the sketch um, and then it closed down of course which was a shame because it was selling 700 odd thousand which any newspaper today would be quite happy with but we were sacrificed at the altar of the Daily Mail, the big sister paper, that's the one they wanted to keep. So. Uh, in 71 I took my Redondo, which I got as a nice car, a Capri, I remember, yes, was good. and I had to find some more work with 270 fellow journalists out of work it, through, the, through the sketch closing down. It wasn't easy, and I, the only job I could land was as, as a sports sub-editor on the Star in Johannesburg. Well, I was all packed and ready to go when the editor of the Sporting Life, who I'd been to see four or five months previously, said, I've now got a, a vacancy for you. I've just had to sack Geoffrey Bernard for, for falling asleep at the, at the horse, horse and hound dinner where he was supposed to be giving a speech, instead of which he fell face forward into the pea soup. Uh, so <laughs> I was Geoffrey Bernard's substitute, although not, not, a, not, not for the brilliance of his writing, uh, bit more sober than that, <laughs> but uh, that's how I got into the sporting life and I stayed there, started off as just a, a, a sub-editor and made myself pretty useful and the editor, the editor went, made me deputy editor then, uh, or number three rather, assistant editor, and uh, I persuaded him that he could sell a lot more papers if he had a regular golf columnist. This is a wonderful wheeze because the circulation was poor. And um, golf was something they, in those days, where bookmakers only did, and I'm sure this is right, the, the open, what was then called the Piccadilly World Match Play and the Masters. I don't think they did any other tournaments at all. They didn't have anyone who knew anything about golf betting, so this was a great chance for me to carve a niche for myself. And uh, first uh, tipped uh, a golfer for the sporting life in 1972 and fortunately it won eight to one 
Lake Trevino, I think it was. But uh, unfortunately, I was too useful inside the office to go out for, for as much as I wanted to because they made me an executive and, and a new editor when Ozzy retired. Graham Taylor said, you, you, you can't do those tournaments in Scotland and France and everything. We, it's no, and I couldn't argue because I don't think it made any difference to the sale. <laughs> uh, so I, I, after doing it, I did 11 tournaments one year and um, I was, went to the Open and there was a special seller of the sporting life there and asked him at the end of Saturday, how's it been going? He said, I haven't sold a single copy. <laughs> So that's how good my golf was. I, mean, I was tipping well, tipping well, so that I, I, I never lost the, the niche of being a golf correspondent, but mainly my main job was, was a production editor, deputy editor, executive editor. I was executive I was one of those things to five editors. So I was quite proud of that, that I got on with all of them. Ozzy Fletcher, Graham Taylor, Monte Court, uh, What's his name? Michael Gallimore and Tom Clark. And I only had one bus stop in all those 25 years, so I must have been uh, quite a reasonable employee, I suppose. I was usually the last one out of the door. My, my work really was in the evening to make sure the page, pages went and to draw the pages. I drew, I drew I was, that was my strength, is drawing pages of the resporting life. Uh, just seemed to have a knack from it. I, drew a lot of pages on the Middlesex County Times. And uh, when, when Sheltham came round, or Ascot, we did a big spread with all the pictures. That was when I came into my own, and my spreads were much admired. And the Erasing Post had just started then. Uh, said, how do you do it, how do you do it? Because they didn't have anyone who could draw pages as good as that. Anyway, golf betting didn't really start in earnest until Racing Post came around with their price-wise charts and uh, they had a chap called Derek McGovern doing, doing the golf tips, he didn't know a lot about it. He was, uh, he was very funny, funny writer but not, not a golfing expert. And then there was Paul Keeley took it over for a year and I think he told me that he'd gone a whole year without tipping a golf winner. Uh, so that was, and so it was when Bruce Millington went over from being sports editor of the life to sports editor of the Racing Post in 1998, when the life closed, he, he persuaded Alan Byrne to take me on as golf correspondent because of my record. So that's, uh, I, I, I had my redundancy from the sporting life and stupidly at the time downsized to this very pleasant place, but I had a five bedroom house in Claygate at that time and uh, and in two weeks I was working for the Racing Post so I didn't need to panic as I had done but I had children at university and I didn't dare risk it so we downsized into this road which I'm very fond of this road it's 20 years ago this week that um, I started on the post so uh, I managed to last to the age of 76 writing for the post and latterly the Racing and Football Outlook which uh, I was so I, I was uh, offered once uh, I touched, reached 70, I think they wanted to get Steve Palmer on board. He was my deputy and a very good one too. And he's got a fantastic knowledge of golf. I think his golf is excellent. But uh, and so I've been pit, pit, pit tip every Tuesday on the Racing Football Outlook for the last seven years and most of them working from home, never having to go on the train or anything, which is wonderful. And, uh, yes, that brings you roughly up to date. Hey, Jeremy, can you, can you tell us how you originally got into golf, which obviously was quite a niche market with the betting and the odds compiling, etc.? Well, I was, I was always in golf insofar as it was a passion of mine. I wasn't very good at it. I got down to nine handicap for a couple of years, but never hit it more than 200 yards, so I was never going to be a superstar. I used to be able to putt a bit, but that's gone now. Uh, and uh, I say, I, I knew this, I know more about golf than I knew about racing when I joined the Sporting Life. So uh, if there was a chance to do some golf, I was, I was wanting to do it. I wasn't necessarily an expert, but more of an enthusiast. 
and um, Ozzy Fletcher was very open to my idea to have uh, some golf in the paper on a fairly regular basis. But it was all a bit haphazard until the Post came along in, was it 1985 it started, the Post? 86, I think. 86. And then it really got serious because they gave a lot of space to golf. And they had a chart, price chart, and the coverage was pretty good, except there weren't too many winners. So I, I was glad they were there because I was pissing all over them with my tips. <laughs> but uh, never mind. I was very glad to join them when I did, and I thoroughly enjoyed working with my old friend Bruce Millington. And uh, Alan Burns been very good to me when I had a little bit of time off through my cancer in 2009. I only actually, and I'm proud of this, I only missed one week's work. And I was, I had 30, 30 uh, doses of radiation and six doses of chemotherapy, so I was a bit of a wreck. So I, it was the work that kept me going. I really enjoyed proving that I could do it. And uh, so I had to miss one, one, one week's work, but that was all. And I haven't missed any in the last few years since I had this other, these other problems. So I'm a, I'm a workaholic really and I wish I had a bit more. Did the, did the bookmakers make a lot more mistakes back in those days so you could capitalise on it? Definitely, definitely. It's all very standardised now. You, um, generally speaking they used to make all the ones that they were going to take bets on. Like the equivalent today would be McElroy and Tiger Woods. Keep them as short as possible and give anyone who's got a, an outside chance a decent price. So there were loopholes to be found. And uh, which said about finding, I gave 300 to one winners, which isn't that many in 45 years, I have to say. But uh, they were useful at the time. And my greatest achievement was in the 2001 Pebble Beach tournament, which had 190 runners. And I put up, uh, four tips, and three of them finished one, two, three at 50 to one, 33 to one, and 40 to one. After which Simon Clare of Coral said, this must be the greatest tipping feat in the history of the world, which uh, <laughs> it's a nice thing to say. Did you, what, what extra yard do you go to find the winners that others fail to spot? I, I probably spend more time watching television and golf than anybody. Well, probably not so much now. There seems to be a lot of amateur, so it's every pro tipsters uh, in the golf scene. Some of them are very good. But uh, I used to watch everything like a hawk, and of course, because I was a reasonable player, I knew who was doing well or was going to do well by the way they were striding. I'm very much interested in the way people walk around a golf course, um, don't give things away. and. Uh, I, I can't really tell you it's it's not a it's not a science golf typically it's not a science it's a, it's a feeling when the time's right or the course is right or a player is coming into form has not really made it made it yet but is going to be making it it's nice to star spot and see people coming through you know and this John Rahm is around today well he's going to win everything he's uh, 23 now He's got a wonderful laid-back approach to the game, and um, he's a great asset to the scene. He's a Spaniard, and we've got him in the next Ryder Cup, which is great news. Is there a mental checklist that you tick off to whittle down the field before coming up with a selection? Well, I write all the field down on a piece of paper. Uh, it was very hard to get the fields in the old days, before the internet came along, and I used to have to ring all the organisers in America to get the list before anybody else when I was doing the odds charts, I was compiling. And uh, and then they faxed it over. Do you remember faxes? Do you remember it? Telex? Yes, it was. that was my civilization, you know, waiting for faxes to come through with the runners. And, and then I, I would um, tick off those who, who were in my shortlist. I'd get it down to about 12 and work from there. So are gophers a bit like, are the real horses for courses in, the, in their golf terms? Oh, very much so. Right? Things like the Masters, which are played on the same course every year, and the Players' Championship. You get mostly the same names. 
actually in the pot, in the frame, not necessarily winning, but they win it multiple times or two to twice. I mean, Mickelson's won three Masters and Tiger's won four, but that's probably because they're just wonderful players. So is watching golf very important or can you glean all you need to know from form figures? To pick oh, it's them? important to watch as much golf as possible. I used to go to golf tournaments, as I said, but I don't go anymore because I think it's... I don't think it's a very attractive sport to follow on the course, except when it's a real event like the Ryder Cup or the Open. I do humdrum bread and butter tournaments every week and I can't see me crossing the road to see many of them particularly in this country. All, all our top players now live in Florida. So uh, our tour is putting on a whole series of not very exciting tournaments, but these are just for now. I mean, in two weeks' time, we've got the PGA Championship at Wentworth, which is a great, great tournament. Everyone comes over for that, although I know that uh, Justin Rose is going to stay in America for uh, le le legitimate reasons. Um, but uh, yes, the season starts in Europe now with the uh, big flagship event at Wentworth and of course there's some very good tournaments after that leading up to the Open which are proper tournaments, the Scottish Open and the Irish Open. Uh, but uh, you know, they've got to get fine sponsors 52 weeks a year now. It's, it's not an easy job to get a golf tournament going. Corals have got them to sponsor the Welsh Classic at Porthcawl for two or three years at the end of the 70s, was it? Yeah, yeah, 79 and 80. Uh, but they couldn't, weren't big enough to uh, fund it and they dropped out. It was, a, it was a shop window for them in Wales, but it didn't really pan out. Although they say we had a good winners of it. Greg Norman won it once. And uh, yes, that was, that was part of it. 